Hello and welcome back to my channel. Uh, my name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined us here once again back in my kitchen for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be looking at expanding our work so far on um, ophthalmology. We've done the first video on how to use uh, the ophthalmoscope and we will be having a demonstration video of that later. Unfortunately, I need to corral a few students to give me a hand. So before that um, is up and running, I thought it'd be a good idea for us to talk about what that red blurry thing is that we're seeing at the back of the eye uh, with the ophthalmoscope. What is the retina? And crucially, um, a video on how diabetes affects the retina with something called diabetic retinopathy. Now, I, I seem to say this an awful lot, but um, ophthalmology was never my um, strong suit but it is something that I have to use regularly at work with regard to diabetic patients. So I think it's really important that we appreciate that ophthalmology and diabetes go hand in hand, particularly because diabetes is a colossal part of my workload. Now, the reason why I say that is that the retina and the blood vessels thereon essentially are a window to the body. I know that sounds a little bit close to the eyes of the window to the soul, but actually you are able to see the finest blood vessels in the body when you're looking at the retina. And otherwise we kind of have to go in and take a you know, chunk of a person to have a look at what those blood vessels are doing. So the eye gives us this ability to take a snapshot about what the potential damage is for diabetes. Now we're going to come to that in a moment or two, but first off, let's just do a simple walk around the retina so that we all know what we're talking about. Now the retina is um, approximately 25 centimeters in area if you were to peel it off the back of the um, eyeball and put it out on a piece of paper. So it's actually quite a large area and on it, there's quite a few things we need to be um, aware of. So starting in the centre, well, a little bit off centre anyway, um, is uh, the optic disc or the fundus. This is where the optic nerve, bringing us back to our cranial nerve uh, examinations, this is where the optic nerve penetrates into the eye and that's carrying somewhere in the region of about one and a half million nerve fibres into the eye. Now it's very important, this optic um, disc is not where the nerve fibres come out, as in this isn't the sensitive bit, in fact this is your blind spot. Um, this is the area where the nerves are entering the eye to be able to go to the retina so we can use it, uh, use them for sight. Now, the most sensitive part of the eye is a little bit over to the side, and this is called the fovea or the macula. And although this is the most sensitive part of the eye, what do we mean by that? Well, I mean it's the area where you can determine two points. So your ability to say, are you looking at you know, a single stick or two sticks at a distance? And this is because it has the highest number of cones in that area. Now, here's the thing for you to do at home. Even though the fovea is you know, the most sensitive part of the eye, it's actually not very good at picking up light because of all the cones there. So try and find a, a very dim star in the sky and try and look at it. You, you can't really see it. Now, look to the side of that star so you're not looking at it anymore. And although you can't look at it as well, it will appear brighter. That's because you're no longer looking at it with the fovea, with the macula, with this most uh, sharpest part of the eye, but you're using the rods and cones on the peripheral of your vision, which are much more sensitive to light. And that, that, that for me, was a big sort of um, understanding about how the eye works. It's very akin to when you realise where your blind spot is and understand that all of this is just a hallucination that our, our brain is uh, projecting for us from the electrical impulses coming in. 
So we've got the, um, the fovea, we've got the, um, the optic disc, and we've got this broad expanse of redness. This is actually the retina covering the rods and cones, the sensitive ends of the nerves that allow us to see. The rods are um, sensitive to light on its own, whereas the cones allow us to see colour as well. I'm actually red-green colourblind, as mentioned before, so I've got a deficiency in one of the cones in my eye, meaning that I don't differentiate sometimes that red and green quite as well. And spreading out across the retina, we've got the veins and the arteries. Specifically though, these arteries and veins become venules, almost at capillary level, the smallest unit of vein, or arterioles, again the smallest unit of, arter of artery, before they become the capillaries. As mentioned, this is where we can non-invasively see those finest blood vessels, and crucially, pick up on early damage due to disease, hence diabetes. So let's just wind back to diabetes for a moment. I, I seem to do a lot of videos about diabetes on this channel because well, it's a hugely important disease. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates there are 500 million registered diabetics and there's probably more that we're not aware of. And essentially we know that diabetes is a disease of too much sugar, but I'm sure a lot of you are going to say, well, so what? Let's look at it from a different perspective. Now, your body runs obviously on blood and that's a fluid moving around all these various tubes and things. That's actually not that different from a car using petrol or diesel. Now, if I get you know, a couple of um, kilos of sugar and dump it in the fuel tank, that's going to gum up the way your petrol or diesel engine works. And yes, before anybody says anything, that that concept has been busted as a myth because of the different filters we have in a fuel tank. Originally, in the 1930s and 40s, it was a tactic in World War II because the, um, the fuel pump was mechanical and that drained from the very bottom of the fuel tank, meaning that, yes, your sugar isn't going to dissolve in the diesel or petrol, but it's going to sit there, thunk, as a unit right at the bottom of the petrol tank, meaning the fuel pump couldn't get fuel to the engine, which is why it was a tactic in World War II. That brief aside out of the way, you've got sugar in the system, and that just affects how your body works. And what do we mean by that? Well, that's actually going to damage the small blood vessels. And because of that small blood vessel damage, we end up with end organ damage. And unsurprisingly, because our blood vessels are everywhere, diabetes affects everything, whether we're talking about your brain and strokes, your heart in terms of um, myocardial infarction and heart failure, your nerves in terms of your sensation, your kidneys, your liver, everything. And we can see that damage early on in the retina, which is why it's crucially important that all diabetics attend their annual retinal screening, because it's the best way of us understanding the potential level of damage that they're experiencing across the body. Yes, I can check a patient's HbA1c and say, your diabetes is very good or it's very bad at the minute. Or I can check someone's kidney function and say, yes, actually, maybe your diabetes is beginning to affect things here because it's going down. But there are so many other conditions that can affect these organs. Whereas when we look at the retina, when we look at the arterioles of the eye, we can say, yes, we, there is definitely a problem going on here. Yes, we definitely need to work harder. And yes, we definitely need to get a stronger um, control on your diabetes. And I think that's a crucial thing. We can work together on that. Not me, the doctor, not you know, the patient. It's not in an individual's job. This has to be a combination going forwards. In the same way that you know, if the mechanic tells me and I'm damaging my car because of how I'm driving it, he's going to help get the car on the road. But it's my responsibility how I drive the car. And we will work together with that. And that's the same with our diabetic patients. OK, so let's have a look at the meat of what we're here for, the diabetic retinopathy. 
There are four stages and they're relatively straightforward. Stage one is diabetic uh, retinopathy. You've got that problem. Stage two is moderate retinopathy. Stage three is severe. And then finally, we end up at that end stage, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That's where we've got a new blood vessels formed on the eye and they're causing damage to the retina and potentially blindness. Now, the body isn't very good at um, you know, stringing together new blood vessels. It's a little bit like if there was a problem with the wiring in your house and rather than getting an electrician in to fix things, you just started putting in more and more um, extension cables. And those extension cables begin to streak along the tables and along your work surfaces and across the floor. And it's a mess. But as you get more of them, you begin to trip over those cables, putting you at risk, but also pulling things off the work surfaces, smashing and damaging things in your house. And that's a crude way of looking at that diabetic retinopathy here. The new blood vessels are not helpful and they're going to do damage to the eye. So with that in mind, um, we know what we're worried about. What do we see with stage one diabetic retinopathy? Well, actually, thankfully, not a huge amount. So when we look at the retina, we need to find one of the blood vessels, the arterioles or venules, and follow them back to uh, the optic disc. And this isn't just about orientating ourselves within the, um, the eye, but actually allows us to assess those blood vessels. And in the first stage of diabetic retinopathy, they swell ever so slightly. These are microaneurysms. And essentially, we're talking about a, you know exceptionally small version of that same aneurysm that we look for during the abdominal examination, the aortic abdominal aneurysm. Here, these aneurysms are so much smaller, but it's still the same pathological processes that are going on. And there in the abdomen, we're talking about one large swelling. Obviously, we can have more. But here in the retina, we're going to be seeing multiple of these um, swellings across the arterioles of the eye. Stage two of diabetic retinopathy, um, again, kind of uh, feels like we're echoing the AAA in the sense that that aneurysm can leak. Well, the same thing can happen in the retina. And those small um, aneurysms can leak, causing dot and blot hemorrhages on the retina. Now, we may not be able to see where the aneurysm is, uh, is actually leaking, but we're certainly going to see those dots and blots across the retina telling us we know the leak is occurring. And this, this bleed is occurring in the deeper layers of the retina of the eye. So the fact that we can see some of that leakage coming out to um, the front of the retina tells us that we are beyond the point of no return. And it's that leak is now going to cause us problems because we're getting proteins, we're getting you know, uh, growth factors like vascular endothelial growth factor leaking into the retina in places where we don't want it. And that's going to potentially trigger the formation of those dangerous new fragile blood vessels. Now, it's not just the dot and blot hemorrhages that are a problem in stage two. Because we've gotten leaks and bursts of blood vessels, that means that there are parts of the retina that are now not getting uh, an effective blood supply. So that part dies. And we see those with what are called cotton wool spots. Now these cotton wool spots sound quite benign and a nice and fluffy cotton wool. But actually, it's a really serious sign where the nerve has become ischemic and is thus you know, producing this um, response. And essentially, that's no different to you know, a small level stroke. But here we're having it in the eye, not because of an obstruction, but because the blood vessel is no longer connected there because of that leak. So with our stage two diabetic retinopathy, we've got the um, we've got the aneurysms, we've got the dots and blot hemorrhages, and we've got those cotton wool spots. If we move to the third severe stage, this is where we get a big red flag. Now, we've described the blood vessels as like strings of butcher sausages with the aneurysms, but there's no actual change to how the blood vessels 
appear, just these swellings along them, with severe diabetic retinopathy. Because of the lack of um, blood supply to parts of the retina now, the body is trying to eke out everything that it can from what it's still got there. So those blood vessels become torturous and elongated with loops and things like that. And that's a really severe sign that this person is likely to progress onto full-blown proliferative retinopathy. The other way this can be described is venous looping or beading. And the reason for this is quite simple. The body is producing chemicals, you know, vascular endothelial growth factor is the main one, where it's trying to compensate for the impaired blood supply it's getting. And it's doing this by working the remaining blood vessels even harder. But as we try and work that harder, we're going to get more damage from that underlying diabetes as well. Hence why at any of these stages, it's so important to try and control the diabetes so that we slow down or hopefully stop the progression. The final stage of this deterioration is proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where the body grows new blood vessels. And you'd think that those new blood vessels would solve the issues that we'd had. But as we've mentioned, that's just like putting random extension cords around your house. It doesn't resolve the underlying problem. But not only that, those blood vessels can actually cause um, further damage because they're so weak. The problem with these new blood vessels is that they're not very good. They're not the original wiring. They're always going to be slightly more fragile, slightly more at risk of damage. And we see this. That's why these blood vessels are such a problem. You can get massive gouting flame hemorrhages across the surface of the retina. And that's not just a problem for putting blood over the sensitive uh, nerve uh, structures of the eye, but also because flame hemorrhages are in the superficial layers of the retina, as opposed to the dot and blot, which we've seen in the much deeper layers. Hence, they're going to be putting these fibrovascular uh, chemicals across the eye, stimulating even more of these uh, blood vessels to develop. And when we've got these damaged blood vessels, they can actually cause traction on the retina, pulling it off. It actually works in a very similar way to you know, a scab that you might get after you've injured yourself. That scab is actually going to contract as it ages, bringing the skin closer together, essentially acting like stitches. Well, the same thing's going to happen with these new blood vessels when they're damaged. They will contract, putting traction on the um, retina, potentially pulling it off the back of the eye, causing a, a retinal detachment. I think overall this, this says why it's so important that patients go for their annual diabetic uh, retinal screening so that we've got an idea of if any of these changes happen so we can try and minimise it and hopefully stop potential blindness. And that, that's the end stage with this. And I can't underline this enough. This is, this is the, the end problem with the diabetic um, eye damage, blindness. And not in just a, you know, a way that, oh, your vision's a little bit blurry and you correct it with glasses. I'm meaning the thing you see with no longer functioning to allow it to take in light. And it's a horrific thing because it's preventable. And that's why it's so important. With this proliferative retinopathy, we can then talk about another form of diabetic blindness, um, diabetic macular edema. So we've got the fovea or the macula, the ma that most sensitive part of the eye, with all of these chemicals floating around uh, within the, uh, the eye itself. We can get edema or swelling to the macula Remember, this is the bit that realistically lets you differentiate, you know, sticks and things, you know, it lets you know what it is you're looking at. If that becomes swollen, well, it doesn't work anymore. It's a little bit like going from looking through a regular glass window to trying to look through one where the glass has been distorted. The whole image changes and no amount of glasses and things like that is going to be able to change that. If that uh, macula there dies, 
wherever you look, the center of your vision will be black. And that for me has always been a, a horrific thing to think about because I'm such a visual person. But more than that, this is something that we can stop by controlling someone's diabetes. And that, that's why it's so sad to me when somebody's vision goes this way because of something that we could have done more about. Okay, so we've, we've tried to highlight how bad diabetes is for the eye, but diabetes is that disease that just keeps on giving. It can also affect uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the lens in the eye, causing cataracts, and we can also get damage to um, you know, the, the plumbing of the eye, meaning that pressures can build up within the eye, and we then get glaucoma, which is going to put damage on the optic nerve. And there we're going to see changes to that optic disc as that pressure uh, impacts on it. Okay, so we've talked about the importance of going for diabetic retinal screening uh, every year. And yes, all of this is silent. But let's go over one thing that we can tell our patients or yourselves at home can be aware of. If you have changes to the vision in your eye, which seem to be a bit much, my vision is blurring. Why is that? If you have blurring of vision and you're diabetic, you need to see somebody as soon as you can. It may be that this is the start of something affecting your eye with regard to the diabetes. Hopefully it's just you need a uh, um, prescription change in your glasses, but I don't want anyone to have that false sense of security. If your vision is blurring, seek help straight away. And hopefully um, it will mean that we catch something early and we can stop it developing all of those um, stages of diabetic retinopathy we've talked about. But let me just add something else that might help. So even if diabetes gets to this proliferative stage, there's always a little bit of hope and we can try and intervene which we can do with lasers to the back of the eye, burning off um, the impacted retina so it doesn't produce these fibrovascular uh, growth factors, triggering more um, uh, blood vessel development. Oh, and if that wasn't good enough, if you do get the macular edema, that swelling of the fovea, then we can give injections to the back of the eye. So on the one side, we should be proud that science and medicine has things that even at that end stage where blindness is you know becoming a very possible outcome there's still things that we can do to even mitigate it at that stage but if we just work harder with our diabetes we'll hopefully never get there this is hugely important to me i'm such a visual creature and it it really makes me upset to see patients with diabetes not recognizing because they don't have the understanding about the retinopathy, the retinal screening, how important it is and how much their lives can change if we don't get um, on top of this because it's all silent changes. I suppose to wrap this up, um, I'm going to go back to what we said at the start. The eye is allowing us a window into the body, into those small arterioles. And you can bet your last prescription of metformin, if a patient has changes to the eye, they're also going to be having changes in the kidneys, the liver, the brain, the heart. So this is hugely important about preventing further damage to patients. Well, I hope that's been useful in understanding diabetic retinopathy, what's causing it, and the stages of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Um, we will be doing another of these videos where we look at how blood pressure, hypertension can affect the eye, um, and I hope to see you on that one. I'd be really grateful if you could like uh, the video here, because essentially that's how YouTube knows that I'm here and we're doing these things, and hopefully that will mean that other people will get a benefit of this video as well. If you're new to the channel and you found it useful, please consider subscribing and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care.